Um, I'm very excited to be your, your host today for this, uh, this session. I'd like to, to welcome you and thank you all for taking time to, uh, to join uh, our meeting this week. I hope it's going to be a very exciting uh, discussion and reproductive discussion uh, for everyone. So I'd like to remind you that the, the topic of the, the meeting is uh, science in society and not science and society. And we've done that um, purposely because uh, we want to remind everyone that uh, scientists, of course, are uh, first and foremost uh, member of society or citizens. And the question we'd like to touch upon is, as citizen, what uh, can be and maybe should be uh, a role with society, within society, um, to, um, to create a society in which there is a um, long-term sustainable future uh, for research, a society in which uh, there is a high level of trust uh, in the work that we're doing and in the, uh, the message that we are uh, sharing. And uh, the discussion will be around those themes, um, trying to understand uh, how can we uh, create that change and why should we do it uh, and try to make the connections to actually make, uh, make progress on this. So the main uh, organizer for this uh, meeting, the main institute is the Earth Life Science Institute based in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and we have gathered about 600 registration total, which is uh, really exciting, uh, from about 70 different uh, countries. So we are a very uh, diverse uh, group of people here. So uh, keep that in mind when you interact with everyone. Uh, you have probably seen already in the uh, welcome email uh, the LC code of conduct for the meetings. Um, the, in, in summary, we are not uh, going to tolerate any form of uh, harassment of, uh, or any form of uh, hate speech. Uh, so please, uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to quickly introduce the uh, other uh, members of the local organizing committee who are going to lead the, um, the next, uh, next few days. Uh, so we have uh, Lota Purkamo from, uh, from Finland, uh, Marine uh, Las Blaise from France, and uh, Donato Giovanelli from, uh, from Italy. So they'll be leading the next, uh, the next few days. The last thing uh, I'd like to, to add before we get started uh, is the fact that even though we split the, uh, the event in three main regions, mostly to keep uh, working hours sane for everyone. So you have, in theory, one region which is kind of close to your normal working hours. Uh, it is really a, uh, a global event. And we have gathered so many people from different uh, countries in an effort to have that global discussion. So I highly encourage you to um, use the platform, KaiStorm, uh, to uh, take part in that discussion. So you can already uh, have access to the uh, Q&A session that happened this morning in Japan. Uh, later today, you will have the Q&A session uh, that's centered around the uh, Americas uh, region. So you can still uh, ask questions in advance on the platform that will be addressed uh, during the Q&A. And tomorrow, you can watch the recording uh, nicely and get the answer that you get that you wanted uh, without having to uh, uh, to work at 11 p.m. or later. Uh, so I hope that you will enjoy uh, the week that we'll have a um, productive discussion. Uh, we all remain available. If you have any uh, question, any doubt, please uh, please contact us. And uh, we are going to start now by uh, listening to a, a little uh, welcome message uh, from uh, Mary Wojtek, uh, who is the uh, former LC uh, executive uh, director. Hi, I'm Mary Wojtek, the head of the astrobiology program at NASA. I'm also a member of the Earth and Life Sciences Institute community at Tokyo Tech and the former executive director of LC. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth annual LC symposium entitled Science in Society. Science is a collective endeavor supported by society and for the benefit of society through the discovery, that creates new knowledge, improves education, and contributes to the quality of our health and well being. Science addresses the mysteries of the universe and provides solutions to our needs in our everyday lives. This has been a great year and a challenging year for science and its relationship to society. JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, select, successfully returned samples collected from a nearby asteroid that will tell us about the formation and early evolution of our solar system. The gene editing technique CRISPR was applied successfully to treat two debilitating, life-threatening blood diseases, including sickle cell anemia, offering hope to millions of people throughout the world. 
And of course, there's COVID. During the past year, COVID-19 has wreaked havoc across the world. Scientists have made unparalleled heroic strides to learn all they can about the virus's biology, how it's transmitted, its mode of infection, and identifying vulnerabilities that have led to the development of a number of vaccines currently available. All of this while struggling with translating fast accumulating evidence for the public as an audience not well versed in the process of science and stemming the dissemination of misinformation, bad science and misdirection. And of course, unfortunately, politics has played a role that has affected the trust in science and scientists and the trust in public health measures related to COVID-19. The topic of science and society couldn't be more relevant than today. The ELSI Symposium aims to address a variety of aspects of science and society, including the roles and responsibilities of the different actors and the expectation each has of the other actors in society. ELSI Symposium was put together by three teams of ELSI members across three time zones, making it truly a global inclusive experience. We have 600 participants registered, equally distributed across those time zones. Please participate as your schedule permits. Have a great week and thanks for joining. And thank you to Mary for that lovely welcome and also to Mattia for introducing uh, and welcoming absolutely everybody. Um, I wonder now if I can just let's help move everybody to action and uh, get the conversation started. We're going to start with a Q&A session with four speakers. Um, before we do that, allow me just to explain exactly how we're going to make that work. Imagine, if you will, we've got a huge variety of people uh, who are attending, all with different language needs. We're using English as our primary language, but obviously there are some people for whom it's not their first language. And so what we're doing is making sure that we create opportunities to capture your thoughts in different ways. To do that, we're going to be using KaiStorm uh, that Mathieu referred to. Allow me to show you how to use that and encourage you, if I may, to use it as much as possible because I think you'll find it valuable. You all joined. Um, just through the main welcome screen here. And down the left hand side, you will see uh, the days, almost like a mini agenda for, uh, for the whole program. If you click on Monday, you'll see that we've already had the Asia Pacific part of the event. Um, but here you'll see the agenda for today for us in Europe and Africa. Um, for the Q&A, the immediate next session, if you click on that part of the agenda, you'll see that we have four speakers, all of whom have uh, provided uh, their keynote speech. We very much hope that you've been able to uh, watch them beforehand. And in a second, we will um, have 15 minutes Q&A with each of them that will be moderated by Mathieu. Uh, if you click, for example, on Chloe's, you'll see that uh, she, we have a link to her long video here, but also a summary video, which we'll play in a second. And there is the opportunity to leave questions for Chloe at the bottom. The way you do this, very simple, I hope very straightforward, down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a little plus icon with an orange background. If you click on it, ta-da, you get a little pop-up and you can ask a question right there, you just click on the little arrow button. We really encourage you to do this throughout, not just today, but also through the rest of the week. It's a fantastic way of making sure that everybody has an opportunity to contribute, but also so that the speakers can see the things that are of real interest to you. So just to go over one more time, find today, find where you are in the agenda. It's coming up for 215 CET and then click on that and we will start in a second with Chloe followed by Claudia then Sam and Jacopo. Um, 
final thought on this is that we, you will have noticed possibly that we are recording today. I, uh, that's because we want to be able to make sure that each of these Q&A sessions are captured and we'll be putting that, them up on KaiStorm. And also the event is being live streamed as well. So uh, we hope that there will, you'll always find one way in which you can pa participate or engage. I wonder if now would be a really nice time, Emma, to play the short uh, summary video from Chloe, and then Mathieu can pick up and uh, go through the Q&A. Absolutely. I'll share it right now. My name is Chloe Hill, and my presentation today will outline the reasons why scientists should engage in the policymaking process and how they can effectively do this. Science can help policymakers consider the different options they have when they're creating policies that will ultimately impact society. However, integrating science into the policymaking process comes with its own set of challenges. And during my presentation today, I outlined what some of these challenges are, as well as the types of things that both individual researchers and the scientific community can do to overcome them. And this includes things like co-creation, improving communication, and building stronger and more diverse scientific communities. Now, the solutions that I outlined during my presentation aren't necessarily straightforward, but I do think this symposium is a great opportunity for us to look at how they could be adopted and effectively put into practice. Towards the end of my presentation, I'll also outline some tips for scientists who want to engage with the policymaking process, but who don't know where to start. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, Chloe, thank, first, thank you very much for uh, preparing this nice uh, presentation for us. I hope many people had a chance to, uh, to see it. Uh, so let me jump right in with some of the, the questions that were uh, put uh, on the platform already. Uh, please uh, add some uh, as we speak. So the, the first one um, by, uh, by Donato is um, try to think about the different roles scientists can play and uh, identify uh, with regarding science or policy. And if I find surprising and scary at the same time that the majority of scientists would identify uh, the pure scientist role. Um, I think that a lot of the current problem connected with the gap of trust presents between the scientific community and society could be actually ascribed to this kind of pure scientist stand. Um, as scientists, we're still members of society uh, and are impacted together with the rest of society by all those policies. So providing uh, information and contextualizing them for a better future should be one of the essential role we play. So for a long time in history, uh, those involved in managing public life were also intellectual and scientists, but this has changed in the last 150 years or so. So perhaps it is a time to reconnect with more active role in politics, or do you think that uh, keeping a clear separation between science and poetry is a, a necessary thing? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Nadi, for this question. It is a really great question. Um, and my answer is, I think, both yes and no. So in my, in my presentation, I talk a little bit about co-creation, which is basically increasing the dialogue between policymakers and scientists so that they can understand each other a little bit better. They know what each other are expecting. Um, and the questions that they create and answer are the right ones. Um, and I think this co-creation process does require scientists to play a more active role in the policymaking process, um, but perhaps not necessarily in politics themselves. So <laughs> I would say um, yes to the policymaking process um, and getting more engaged. And that includes not only starting to get engaged with particular questions, but also once you are engaged in the policymaking process, just engaging more with that policymaking that you're interacting with uh, is really key in terms of science of policy and playing this sort of honest broker role where you're providing impartial evidence um, to help policymakers come up with the right decisions. But then in terms of other aspects, um, you can get a little bit more engaged. So there's another question I'm going to answer in a, a bit later, I assume, um, that talks a little bit about something I would call policy for science. And this isn't something that I go into much in my presentation apart from outlining it. Um, but I know that Casey, who has a separate presentation, does go into it. So if you haven't watched his presentation, I would recommend it. Um, the policy for science is basically all of the things that help support the scientific community, things like research funding, um, things like education and um, how things are taught. So all of this kind of thing that's really important for researchers to have is more policy for science. And I think here, 
scientists don't necessarily need to be researching these particular topics of, you know, why is scientific education important to be able to engage with it. And here they can play more of a, an advocacy or, or political role, but it is really, really important to separate that from science or policy and providing us impartial evidence. Um, so in this aspect, I guess you can say they should play a bit more of an active role in, in policy making. But again, if you're providing evidence, that's one thing. If you want more research funding, that is something that has to be completely separate. And again, I'll come back to this in, in a different question. Um, another aspect I will just mention in terms of this particular question is that, you know, scientists can actually move away from academia and they can actually move into a policymaking decision if that's the route that they would like to take. Um, scientists have done this before in the European Parliament, for example, there are a lot of members of the European Parliament who actually were previously scientists or who have a PhD. Um, and that gives them quite a unique perspective that they can bring to their decision making. Now, of course, once you become, you know, a member of the European Parliament or any kind of policymaker, you are no longer a scientist. You're seeing things from a very different perspective and you, you shouldn't play that scientific role. It is still important to separate those. Um, but I think we, we should see more scientists who, who become policymakers themselves. I think that would be great. And let me thank you for a very nice answer. I think that answers partly the question I had on, on the platform. But if I can jump back on this, yes. you make yes. a really strong split between um, science for policy and policy for science. But you could argue that um, when we uh, advocate for better scientific education to have a uh, more science literate um, population, that's formed a kind of to create a society in which in the future we'll have good funding because people understand why that's necessary. Mm -hmm. But in, you could also uh, argue that the problem of say uh, climate change could be in the same way. Like if the planet goes into a bit more emergency mode, there's going to be less money available for ha to have like a, a basic science work in the future. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that's a really good point. Now, I would still see that as policy for science. Um, and actually, there's someone else who asked this, another similar question I saw on the platform regarding how we should talk about climate science and things like that. Um, but I mean, I, I can actually give an example here, not necessarily of how, how I or how the European Geoscience Union has done policy for science or science education, but how we've sort of um, highlighted the fact that we think there should be more um, research funding in Europe at the moment and we think there should particularly for um, fundamental research we think there should be more funding and we have actually made a statement about that as a scientific union um, because it's something that all of our council members agreed upon. Now when we did this it was very very important for us to not mix that with any other scientific evidence. So we put out a statement saying we think research funding is important and we actually referenced the climate crisis you know scientific evidence is really important for helping us to manage the climate crisis but we didn't add any scientific details here we didn't say this is what's happening um, in terms of climate science because we don't want to mix those two things and there's a couple of reasons for this um, firstly you want to know your audience so if you're creating a statement that's policy for science focused it's either research funding or scientific education focused um, you are targeting very specific policymakers. now mm -hmm. if you start talking about climate science they're not going to be the same policymakers that you're targeting here um, so you don't want to dilute the message and um, you want to make sure it's targeted but the second and more important reason is you don't want your scientific evidence you're providing to come across as biased. You don't want someone to read your statement and say, oh, they're only asking for more money because um, they want more research funding. And that's, that's a line people can draw and it can be, you know, um, unintentionally drawn. It can be uh, drawn on purpose by some people sometimes. And, you know, people will draw that line sometimes regardless. But we really want to try and separate these things as much as possible. Um, and actually, my takeaway from this would be if you are an individual scientist or even a scientific organisation, really think about um, what you want to focus on. And maybe from, from the EGU perspective, the European Geosciences Union, we focus a lot more on science for policy than we do policy for science. That is where our expertise is. That is what we are most focused on. It's actually very rare for us to do anything in terms of policy for science. Um, and I would say the vast majority of scientists and even scientific organisations don't have the capacity to do both well. Some do, but most individuals and most smaller organisations don't. So I would say either pick one or the other. And if you do have the capacity to do both, make sure you do them separately. Would be my takeaway. That makes sense. Thank you. 
Uh, I'd like to continue with a question from, uh, from Harrison. And he brings up the concept of uh, co-creation that you brought up mm -hmm. uh, and asks, um, and uh, yeah, the question that scientists uh, are asking are actively answering are those that grants are available for. And that can lead to a, a snowball uh, effect where generation scientists are trained in particular fields. And then when uh, perhaps the field becomes less fruitful, it may have uh, already like a large constituency uh, supporting its continued funding, even though it becomes less effective. So the question is, um, how does the concept of co-creation captures the competing interests of factions of scientists uh, in addition to the more general interest of scientists versus policymakers? Hmm. Okay, this is a good question. Um, let me just have it, I think guys. Yeah, so I think when we talk about co-creation, the, the concept I was uh, sort of presenting was more, you know, how you actually talk about that with policymakers. But quite often, co-creation does involve scientists coming together as a community and talking about the issues as well. Um, and it's, it's not always so straightforward. It's not always um, cohesive, but it is it's an important discussion to have. Um, so I think even though, I mean, you're always going to have these competing interests whether you have co-creation or not. But I think co-creation can help you find um, a consensus or something close to a consensus or find the areas in which there are consensus. So maybe there isn't consensus in one area, um, but you can agree on something else. And so you see this quite a lot. The EU Commission actually has these expert groups where they get a lot of different scientists and also people from industry and different stakeholders together to work on a specific topic. Now, these the scientists who are working on this specific topic, they, they might come from all different backgrounds um, and they might have different interests and different uh, sort of areas they would like to focus on. But the purpose of this, this expert group is to work on this specific topic and find areas of consensus they can then give the commission to help create that, start that legislation process. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say the co-creation process isn't perfect and it is time consuming, very time consuming, or at least it can be. But at, at the end of the day, these issues are gonna exist regardless and it's one way of helping to overcome them. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to which extent the, um, there's a, um a potential negative kind of inertia in a system where if you spend a lot of time, um, maybe it goes in the same direction as uh, Harrison's question, if you mm -hmm. spend a lot of time um, kind of advocating for and co-creating some research scope for, for your interests, then you want to kind of extract as much value as you can from it once accepted at the detriment of maybe new ideas that may actually be more fruitful locally. Okay, so look, uh, fruitful in, in what, what way exactly in terms of like a, it's necessary for policy or it would, would help a policy? Yeah, or... like more, more, yeah, yeah. more time. Really. Yeah, um, so I guess that's more of an issue of the, the time frame. Or yeah, and this, this, is an, this is a big issue actually in terms of policy making. And as I said, co-creation can be time consuming. Um, but I think quite often when you engage in the co-creation process, um, it's something that might start at a particular point and it might start, you know, after policymaker requests something um, and you start that discussion and maybe, maybe you don't quite find the resolution in time, but just because, you know, you, you had a deadline and you met the deadline and you submitted something and it's done doesn't mean it's the end of that co-creation process. You know, you can keep communicating with this group of people that you have ready for the next topic that's going to come up and, you know, really wait for that policy window to come along so that when you when it does come along, you are ready. You have already discussed certain certain areas that are really relevant and then you can, you know, act on it as soon as it comes up. Great, thank you. Uh, so another question by, by Maureen. Uh, so indeed, in the talk by uh, Casey and uh, Dreyer, he talks a lot uh, about the, uh, the funding situation in the US and the long-term trend. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the, the European situation? <laughs> yeah, I, that's a, it's quite a broad issue, I would say. Um, I, I, in terms of it comparing it to the US perspective, uh, from what, I, from what I know, the EU has a slightly longer term funding situation in that it comes around every sort of seven years. It's not, it's not annually, which I think the US is. Um, and one of the reasons we did focus on it quite a lot this year is because it was the time to really focus on, on this issue. Um, of course, there are always different funding issues that pop up. COVID, for example, will change some things um, and some budgets because money needs to be spent elsewhere. Um, but in terms of 
you know how it evolves long-term evolution of science fundings in Europe um, yeah I'm not quite I'm not quite sure how to answer that question exactly <laughs> I mean I've got to say as I said I do focus a lot more on science policy the policy than policy for science and science funding um, but I know Claudia she's She's got her Q&A up next and she's very in, involved in, uh, in research funding. So maybe that's one I can uh, pass off to her. Very good transition. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any question on the chat or here. So do you want to have a, a final word or something? Otherwise, we can move on to the next q &A. Um, My only final word is if you are interested in getting involved in science or policy and sharing your research more broadly, uh, you absolutely should. Uh, I think there's room for everyone. Um, yeah, regardless of what area your expertise is, I know there was a question about that earlier, it might mean you have to zoom out a little bit and really think about, you know, what is the policy aspects that are relevant to your area of expertise or your particular topic. Um, but I think there is definitely room for everyone and it's just a matter of deciding what area exactly you want to focus on. So, Good, thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Something I Chloe, uh, oh, thank you, Mattia. Chloe, uh, brilliant way to start things off, a really lovely insight into, uh, into the EU. Um, and I wonder if I can remind everybody at this stage just to um, uh, use KaiStorm where we can. It will feel awkward. You're listening to people and you're thinking, probably you've got great thoughts in your mind. I'd really encourage you to put it in KaiStorm because this is a community. And it's really nice to be able to share your thoughts in the community, particularly if in this early stage, you don't have the ability to uh, speak or ask questions directly of Chloe, Claudia, Jacopo and Sam. So just to remind you, if I may, before we uh, jump on to Claudia, this is where we're going to do that. And forgive me for those of you who've already got it. Uh, we've got our, our agenda for Monday. We've got uh, today's activities right now, the Q&A. Um, we've got Chloe, who, from whom we've just heard. We're just about to hear from Claudia. And again, if you've got any thoughts or questions to add to, um, to Claudia's page here, just click on the plus button. And it's a great way of making sure that we can all participate in the conversation. Uh, with that, uh, I know, Claudia, that you don't have a, um, a short summary presentation, and that is no problem at all. Uh, what we can probably do whenever you feel appropriate, we can throw up a, uh, a quick slide, which I know summarizes some of your thinking. Claudia, how would you like to play this? Yeah, just go ahead and show the slide. That's fine with me. And apologies for not having prepared uh, this short uh, slide. Okay, maybe it is a surprise. Sorry, Maureen. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just to try to summarize my, uh, my talk for those that uh, were unable to watch the nearly 25 minutes. Uh, so for a funder, uh, I guess the possibility or the mere possibility of having any biases affecting the, the, the fairness uh, of, uh, of the evaluation and the grant peer review process is of course a, a matter of serious concern. And therefore uh, we really need to ensure that uh, not only we do everything we can, uh, but also that we show and to, we demonstrate to our uh, stakeholders that we are doing so. And um, so then there is a, a, a some summary uh, messages that are at the bottom of this slide. Uh, so for instance, our key learnings from all this process. So we, we've been uh, uh, um, operating for over 10 years. And uh, as you may have seen, we do have some uh, positive results. And often I'm asked, uh, so of all these actions that you've taken, which one was the, the most successful one? And I, I can't really pinpoint uh, one single action. I really think it's a cumulative effect of various actions. But above all, I think it's, it's also the trust that we've passed on to our pot potential candidates that they know that they can trust our evaluation, but also, um, also the reviewers, the way we have uh, briefed them and the way we, uh, we, we conduct the, the evaluation process. It's, um, 
I think it really passed on to the community. And uh, despite all these positive uh, uh, results, uh, we need to keep reminding ourselves that the work is never done. So we can't just uh, uh, become uh, a bit complacent and just to relax. We have to remain vigilant. Um, there's also a big uh, challenge in my personal view, which is the stereotype threat. So as, as we uh, sometimes see a lot of negative uh, uh, data uh, being shown, we have to, to really take care when we show this data and which impact this has in the community. Because I think it's something I say in the next slide is that uh, uh, most, of us, uh, most of us, we don't want to be martyrs. So we need to think that there is hope, that there is a, a fair chance that uh, we will be treated fairly and uh, that we have equal chances and equal opportunities as, as, anyone, uh, as anybody else. Or we will, it's not worth the, the, the time that we invest in putting together uh, proposals. Uh, so as a takeaway message, if I still have time for this, uh, I think it's super important to know your data. You know, that's your starting point. If you don't know it, you don't know how bad you are or, or how good you are, or maybe you're just, you know, halfway through. So just know your data, make it publish, make it public. You have nothing to hide. It's You just need to acknowledge where you are and then just take the actions that are needed to, to improve the situation and share, of course, role models and inspirational stories. Um, I think we can maybe, I can stop here now. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much for, for the summary and for the, the great talk. I really learned a lot watching it, so I, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, so let's start with a question. We have one from, uh, from Lotta. Uh, she's asking about the discussion between ERC and scientific studies. Some of the societies are notoriously old fashioned. So how do you deal with those? With those? Do you try to get studies to recognize the unconscious biases or gender imbalance uh, and nudge those towards the right direction? That's a quite an interesting question. Uh, yeah, I yes, yeah, maybe some of the societies tend to be a bit more traditional, but I also tend to believe uh, that not everybody in those societies will be traditional. Maybe some of the more um, yeah, maybe some of the decision making bodies may be more traditional, but if you talk to the younger generation, for instance, I think you'll find some really interesting uh, uh, ideas and, and motivated people that are willing to, to engage in, in, in pushing uh, the limits and, uh, and uh, coming up with really good innovative ideas and shake the boat a little bit. So, of course, it's not up to the ERC to go and tell societies what they should do, but we do engage uh, uh, quite um, strongly with the scientific community. So the role of the ERC is to serve the scientific communities. So what we do uh, is we encourage the, all the scientific officers like myself to, to attend yearly uh, um, major scientific conferences in their fields. And what we've seen recently or, or throughout the years is that more and more they are uh, starting to present, of course, data on demographics, and that steers a discussion. And once you have a discussion going, you will immediately identify people that come to you and say, oh, this, this data is really interesting. Can we, can we do something else? Can we next year organize a session that it's focused on equality, diversity, and inclusion at this conference? And then you just, you know, the, once you start it, then it's really, uh, it's amazing the things you we can we can accomplish. And uh, maybe some of you know what uh, what we've been doing at EGU. But once we've started, it started just with a with a session that we decided to organize myself together with uh, a couple of panel members from the from the one of the ERC uh, uh, panels. And, uh, and now there is an, a, a diversity and equality working group at EGU, and uh, it's really been an amazing adventure, I have to say. Okay, hey, well, it's good to see. Um, another question is from Maureen, and she is wondering if you have enough data to say something for specific panels. Um, so in, in particular, uh, the evolution uh, uh, in, spe in some panels. And the same question uh, for specific countries, if you have the data. 
Okay, so the data I presented, as you saw, of course, it's uh, it's agglomerated data, but we do have disaggregated data for all panels, for all calls, and uh, in fact, you can find it online. We have it published after each call. We publish this this data broken by panel. So yes, we do have the data. Um, so we can see some evolution, uh, positive evolution in most uh, in most panels. What we see is that uh, if we look in terms of domains, so we have uh, the life sciences, the physical sciences and engineering, and then we have the social sciences and humanities. What we see is that uh, in social sciences and humanities, we have much more balanced uh, uh, gender representation. Um, then in the PE, uh, uh, we have uh, some panels like mathematics and physics, where indeed there is a very low representation of women even applying. And then we have in life sciences also some uh, some some questions that we, we haven't answered, which is why, why there is such a low success rate in, in some specific panels. So it does vary a lot, but we have observed a positive evolution from the first framework program and the last one, which just finished now in December. Um, then there was something about countries. Um, okay, countries is, uh, is a little bit more complex because countries, it's, there's the country of affiliation, and you also have mm. the nationality country, uh, which we tend not to look so much, but we've also done this, uh, this observation. Uh, if you look at the top countries, yeah, which uh, it's usually, you know, it's the UK, Germany, France, um, there hasn't been much changes in, in their uh, share of, of, uh, of the, the calls in, in uh, the success rates. But what is interesting is that when you normalize it by the population, they are not necessarily the most successful ones. And also when you dig into see, for instance, uh, the nationalities of the principal investigations at these countries, for instance, in the case of the UK, the large, the large majority are not English or, or they are not from the UK, they're actually Germans. So, you know, there's a, there is so much uh, interesting information and, um, uh, and, and things that are interesting to, to look at and that they are not so, so um, it's not so simple. Eh? It requires some, some cautious in the analysis too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, I saw an interesting statistic showing that, uh, was it the, the Italian were actually quite successful, but not the, Italy, the country itself. Uh, exactly. As long as you're not based in Italy, you're fine. Yes, there was a, a, a few years ago, there was a, some movement from Italy, uh, some Italian representatives, uh, you know, raising the issue that uh, there was a big uh, brain drain from Italy to the UK, uh, and that the ERC was somehow um, supporting this brain drain. And we did a lot of analysis in, on, on this. And in fact, what we realized, yes, there was a lot of Italians in the UK, but they were already in, Ita in, uh, in the UK before they got the grant. Mm. So it was not the ERC. As you know, the ERC is, is a portable grant. So whoever receives an ERC grant can take the grant wherever they want, wherever they are given the best uh, uh, research conditions. So uh, uh, it's, but, we, we, but in fact, we don't have a very high mobility, we have to say. Maybe at starting grant, and usually um, during the contract phase. So not necessarily during the grant implementation, but you know, you get an ERC starting grant, and you go and you say, "Look, this is what I have. I have an ERC grant. Who offers me the best conditions? And why not? You're young, and you want to to start your own team, and uh, why not look for the best conditions and negotiate that?" True. That's true. Uh, next question is by, by Emily, and she wants to check her understanding that um, the recent data, so 2014, 2019, uh, shows that the difference in applicants and grantees are uh, less than 1% female. Uh, can it be reflected as women generally not being filtered out during the grant selection? I'm not sure I understand the not filtered out. What uh, is it? That the bias was removed, I suppose. There is basically no bias in the current uh, selection process, that the outcome is the same fraction as the uh, application pool. So what we have seen in the, um, in the last framework program is that the uh, success rate, the overall success rate of men and women is the same. It's about 13%. 
I think it's, you're probably referring, I think it's the starting grant where there is, uh, I think it's 36% submissions, mm -hmm. so uh, candidates, and then 35% uh, um, uh, grantees. So this is an os oscillation, just a minor one, but uh, the overall success rate is equal now for, the, uh, for okay. men and women in the ERC in the last seven years, the overall. Okay. Uh, and in fact, in, uh, we just noticed, if, if you're curious about the impact of the COVID out outbreak, and I was just looking at that uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were surprised because we only had one call that closed after the outbreak, which was Advanced Grant 2019, that had the deadline in August. And what we've seen, surprisingly, was that not only the, um, the total numbers increased, so for men and women, but we had the highest share and also absolute numbers of submissions from women. Okay, that's and interesting. It was very interesting, and we were all very surprised. It's uh, so. Okay. I, I don't have many uh, very complex hypotheses to justify this, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's a positive message to to send out there. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think we have time to, to tackle the, the last question, but I think I'll take the, the chance to, um, to remind everyone that um, if you keep posting questions in the chat, in the Kaistan um, uh, platform, even after the Q&A, hopefully the, the speaker can still take the time to go and answer them uh, in, in writing. So uh, hopefully you can still um, do this and hopefully Donato's uh, question, which was quite interesting, can be, uh, can be addressed as well about the question of uh, quotas versus uh, uh, just uh, educating about uh, bias. But uh, thank you very much, Claudia, for the, the Q&A and for preparing this nice talk. And I'm looking forward to more, uh, more answers. Uh, and uh, you said exactly what I was going to say, Mathieu, which is do please use Kaistorm, capture any new questions, because it's, it is persistent. It will stay here. We'll keep all of this data up here for at least three months after the uh, symposium has finished. So if you want to come back or you want to refresh your memory or have another look at the, uh, the videos of the speakers, this is the place to do it. And uh, we will encourage speakers if there are new questions to, to respond to them within KaiStorm using those little stickies that I showed you. So please do use those. Uh, now we have a uh, third in our Q&A series, uh, Sam Illingworth. Sam, welcome. Lovely to see you here. Um, Sam will kick off with a um, just by showing your short summary video, if that's all right, and then we'll kick off the Q&A with Mathieu. Emma, is that all right? Hi everyone, my name is Sam Illingworth, Senior Lecturer in Science Communication at the University of Western Australia. And this is just a short reminder of my talk, which is around using poetry in games to develop dialogue between scientists and non-scientists. In this talk, I give examples from my own research about how we can use games and poetry to move beyond one-way methods of communication and instead how we can engage different audiences and different publics so that we can diversify science, make it more accessible and ultimately make it a more um, accessible place for everybody to hang out and do science together in a meaningful way that can contribute towards the development of science, but also to society more generally as well. As a reminder, here's also my contact information if you'd like to get in contact with me regarding anything in this presentation and beyond. Thank you. Right. Uh, hi, Sam. Uh, thank you for preparing a very interesting talk. Uh, it was very surprising to me. And uh, thank you for joining the, the Q&A. No, thank uh, you very much for inviting me, Matthew. Great. So the, the first question is by Lotta. And she's uh, wondering what your thoughts are about uh, science art versus science fiction. Do you think that people understand, for example, poems are written from actual scientific publications are based on facts, whereas science fiction stories may not have anything to do even with the laws of physics? Yeah, thanks. This is a great question. I think I don't want to speak for all poetry ever written about science, nor every scientific fiction novel, novella, short story ever written. But I actually think that a lot of scientific poems or science poems, such as the ones that I write, that my colleagues write, that we host on the Consilience website, they're derived by 
scientific fact but they're really inspired by it so they might use different languages they might take it in different directions but the idea is to hopefully um encourage people to find out more about the scientific research that it might inspire or that it was based upon with regards to scientific fiction i think it's very interesting because if you look at the scientific fiction written in the 1950s 1960s 1970s especially by uh, and a bit later like people like william Gibson, etc., people that you might actually class as futurists rather than necessarily science fiction writers. A lot of that has actually basically come true. So that's not to say that the science fiction that's written today is not ever going to be fact. And a lot of the very good writers that are writing at the moment actually have that in mind as well. So what I would say is that science fiction writers aren't just necessarily making things up out of their head. A lot of it's based on incredibly detailed research in terms of what's going on in the current field and what's going there forward as well. But hopefully like poetry that's written about science, it's a medium that can encourage people to find out more about scientific topics and which opens it up to new audiences, hopefully in an accessible and uh, aspirational manner. Oh, thanks. There's something that uh, was very new to me what uh, listen to your talk is this idea that um, you could have communication just to create kind of excitement and will to actually learn about things and not just communication to um, to convey facts that was quite interesting uh, so marine has a question about um, uh, game design <clears throat> and uh, of course you have many different kind of uh, of gaming difficulties given your your audience uh, and she's wondering uh, how did you choose the audience uh, you um, for the games you designed yeah, it's a really good question. So I think with any science communication activity, you want to be thinking about the topic that you're trying to communicate or develop dialogue around. Then you want to be thinking about the audience and then you want to be thinking about the format. And for the games that we've developed, I think it's really important to think about what are the um, criteria that you've got. So with the specific audience in mind or the specific public, what are the limitations like how long do they have to play the game like what's the physical space that they've got for the availability of the game are they able to purchase a bit a copy of the game are they able to print off a version of the game and then most importantly of all what is the gaming literacy of your um, audience so we think a lot in science communication about science literacy and you know it's very easy for us to forget those of us who have been working on a scientific topic for 10, 15, 20 years, that actually we're using terminology that can actually alienate people because it's jargon to them. And it's the same with games. You know, most of my research is around tabletop games and board games and card games. And I've been playing games for like 30 odd years. And so when I play a game, it's, I pick something up very quickly, not because I'm a genius, but just because I've got a lot of experience in doing so. So when I'm working with a specific audience, it's necessary to understand what are their experiences with games? You know, have they played Monopoly before? Have they played Risk? Have they played really complex games? Have they never played games before? Are we working with a community for whom card games is um, a social taboo, you know, because it's associated with gambling, et cetera. So it's really, really important to work with the audience. And as with all science communication, to ask the audience what their needs and what their requirements are rather than to assume anything in that instance. So we tend to ask them what their needs are, what they, what kind of thing they'd like, and then either we suggest games to play with them or we specifically design games that are, are for that audience um, in mind. Right. That makes sense, thank you. Um, those two questions are quite related, one by uh, Brandon and one by Theo. I'm wondering about um, kind of outside of poetry, uh, are there other ways you would suggest to, to do this? And Theo more specifically about um, theater. Uh, he's wondering about uh, the, your thoughts about incorporating more sense into plays and if there are a lot of this already in the world. Uh. Yeah, of course. So, you know, I talk about in my talk uh, with science communication, I guess we can break it down into two areas. There's the one way method of communication where we're trying to communicate facts to an audience, which is absolutely necessary in some instances and for which poetry, music, dance, sculpture, theatre, etc., are, are very, very powerful. But where I think really excellent interdisciplinary science communication takes force is where we're in investigating new ways of developing this dialogue. So it's not just me telling a non-scientist about my research, it's me working with non-scientists to understand their lived experiences, their needs, their tacit expertise, and how I can utilize that to inform my own research practices and divine my own research direction as well. And I think that the arts in general offer an incredibly powerful way to do that because as I talk in the talk, they 
provide a means through which to level hierarchies of intellect and they create a space, a safe space, if you will, in which such dialogues can take place. I actually think, speaking specifically to Theo's point, that theatres may be the best of all of the arts at doing this. You know, we can take examples of forum theatre um, and places in Brazil do this very, very well, uh, where we create a um, environment in which people can basically role play out different situations to see what will happen and then use that to inform scientific practices etc going forward so i think the forum theater and theater in general is very very effective i think there's lots of examples of theater being used as a again effective one-way method of communication you know plays about climate change plays about vaccines etc sometimes with those plays where it's very much you're watching something like you would um a film or a piece of art there's sometimes they can be a little bit dogmatic or polemic and is it somebody just telling me their diatribe whereas something like forum theater or participatory theater is a very powerful way of enabling those voices that aren't normally heard to be able to contribute towards the dialogue in a meaningful and sustainable fashion that's actually a very good transition i think to um, to harrison's question because he says that he's um not an artist, a consumer of art, but uh, notice that the, um, the pieces that are more um, thought-provoking and enlightening to him are the ones that strike the right balance between accuracy uh, and subtlety. And so how do you uh, approach this, finding this right balance between being too obvious and spreading the message? It's a very good question. And I think the only answer is to ask. I mean, it's, it's impossible to guess what your audience's needs are. I think you need to, wherever you can, work with that audience, like no matter which way you're communicating science, right? I always think of an example when I was a PhD student many years ago, and I was, um, my PhD was in using satellites to make measurements of greenhouse gases at the Earth's surface. And I did this poster, it was in Annecy in France, about this satellite called Moppet, measurements of pollution in the troposphere. And I did this, I thought I was a great science communicator. I made this poster and I was like, look at this poster, isn't it great? And this older gentleman came over and started talking to me. And I said, this is a poster about a satellite. Did you know a satellite is an object, man-made or otherwise, that orbits the earth? And they carried on like this. And at the end of the presentation, I said, and remember, what does Moppet stand for? That's right, measurements of pollution in the troposphere. And he went away and I thought to myself, you've done it again, Sam, you've just nailed that presentation. And then my friend came up to me and he said, Sam, do you know who that was? And I was like, yeah, some guy who now knows what Moppet is. And he said, that was the guy who built that satellite. So I was like, it was okay. one of the most horrific moments of my life. And I still sometimes get cold sweats when I think about it at night. But I could have completely avoided that situation if I just stopped and asked the audience what their needs, what their experiences, what their expertise were. And so that's something I try not to repeat now. And, and whatever I'm doing, I try to create a platform in which that dialogue can take place. And the first thing of which is, is this something you're interested in? What's your background? What's your experience? And it's something I think that all of us could do um, no matter what our situation. That's, true. That's a very good, um, very good lesson. Uh, so there's a question by Lotta uh, who asked that, um, who said, of course, so many of her, uh, many scientists I know, sorry, are actually uh, really enthusiastic and uh, expressing themselves in many forms of art and craft. Uh, and I think that doing science is actually a little bit like doing arts. Um, artists create art by, oh, create art by, and scientists do science by observing and interpreting the world around them in a creative way. Uh, what do you think of this? I think that's definitely true. I mean, I think that whenever I write a poem or write a piece of music or I'm doing something artistic, I can I, I go about the same process as if I'm doing something scientific. I mean, I don't I don't think that they're mutually exclusive entities. I think that they're complementary disciplines that enable us to make better sense of the world in which we live, each of which gives us a part of a jigsaw that we can then move together as a whole. I, I really would love eventually to do a study where I get people to like do like a brain scan to work out which part of your brain you're utilizing when you're doing a complex scientific experiment versus when you're writing a complex poem or doing a complex piece of artwork because i, I imagine that be very similar um, that you can talk to people who are very successful poets and artists so poets and scientists or artists and scientists people like the czech immunologist miroslav holub um and and, and, and others who have carved out a successful careers in both and 
they do seem to have exact go about writing poetry or doing art and doing science in very much the same vein. So I think that is very much the case. I'll, I'll just use this as well as an advertisement for our journal, which I've just put into the chat for everyone. This is uh, the world's first science and poetry peer reviewed journal, which I talked about in the talk and which everyone's really welcome to read and submit to in the future because as Lotta and Matteo alluded to, I think that many scientists are incredibly creative, talented people. And I'm just kind of sick of people being told, you're a scientist, you're a poet, you're a dancer, you're a sculptor, stick in your little box, little person. And that's just not true. We're all human beings with limitless potential. And we should all be encouraged to explore different and complementary ways of understanding the world and the way in which we live. And I hope that the journal is one way in which scientists and people that have just got an interest in science and poetry more broadly uh, can get involved. Well, great. I think um, I'm glad you were able to, uh, to share that information and uh, thank you for, for creating that journal. I think it's a very good uh, addition to the world. Uh, so thank you. And I think you. Uh, it's, uh, it's about time now. So um, well, thank you so much for your contribution. And I'm looking forward for to more discussion with you in the future. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. And Sam, uh, add my 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 thanks as well. We uh, in the past have done quite a lot of work with with scientists doing stand up comedy as well. So we're, it's a, a a lovely asset to bring to to our world. Um, with that, I wonder if we could move on to Jacopo, um, who is our final. Uh, presenter today as part of this Q&A. Um, again, you won't mind if I remind you, please do capture any questions for Sam. Put them into KaiStorm because, of course, he'd be able to see them and respond to them if possible. And if you've got new questions for Jacopo, please put them there as well. Uh, you'll see he has his own individual page. Um, Emma, are we OK to play Sam's short summary video? We sure are. Give me one moment. Hi, this is a remind of my about my presentation. And uh, what I will try to do in the time given, it is to uh, argue that uh, being a scientist and diving with the media is uh, sometimes tricky. There are some obstacles, of course, but I will try to argue that actually there are many benefits. And many benefits that can uh, help you and the media and uh, actually um, ultimately the, the citizens and the public. Uh, I will close up telling you about the power of telling stories and how you as a scientist you could actually help the media to deliver a better message, a more effective message, if you will already think about stories and how you could shape your information, your messages, in a form of a story. So if you can handle stories, you will help the media. And actually, I believe it will help you in many other chances and opportunities when you have to communicate your science. Right, well, thank you very much for your um, presentation and little summary. It was very uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, so I'm going to start by the, uh, from the end this time. And I have a question from, uh, from Donato, who is wondering about the tendency to uh, sensationalize uh, results in a media story uh, in many cases. Do you think that this is a result of um, the nature of media storytelling overall, or perhaps just a consequence of the societal changes linked to how the public consumes information in short five bytes? Yeah, okay. Uh, you can hear me, can you? Yeah. yeah. Good. So thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Um, it's very interesting also the way you develop this, technically speaking. Um, that's an intriguing question, I must say, about the sensationalization or um, hyping sometimes in the media. Uh, first of all, I, I must say that as a communicator, I, I'm, I see that this is kind of an issue in the scientific community. Uh, I see that there is a kind of, uh, as I said, as Donato said, a concern, even sometimes scared of, of moving emotions, uh, which is something that actually journalists uh, might tend to do. Uh, on one side, I would say that uh, moving emotion is a way to 
strengthen your messages. Uh, you, you reach the mind, the brain, the head of your audience by moving through the heart. That's what journalists try to do. That's actually, in a, it's something with, that we have inherited in a, more than hundreds, thousands years of human, uh, human evolutions. So we are used to learn things through stories. And stories are not only contents, data, graphs, numbers, uh, raw data. Actually stories, as I said, reach the mind by, by going through the heart. So that's actually why journalism has developed this way of of uh, putting, triggering emotions, trying to build empathy uh, with the audience so that the message is stronger, is more effective. This is actually uh, the good side of, of telling stories and the good side of, of, of the media or how information is passed through, through humans. It's actually part of communication, but it's true. It's true, uh, and it's not a news. We all believe that this is something very new, but actually since, since from the beginning of, 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 of journalism, there was a, a kind of tendency to uh, hyping or to sensationalize or to boost or inflate uh, the news. Uh, and this is actually part of the market. As I, I'm sorry to tell to the scientific community, but the media is a business. They need to sell, uh, as McDonald's does. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't sell your papers, you will shut down your news agency, your, your newspaper, and that's why, of course, as McDonald's do, uh, they try to push, and journalists try to push, and that's where its sensationalism, uh, sensationalization may come, and that's actually the, the known good side of journalism. Uh, this said, I mean, um, in a way it is unavoidable, or at least I see uh, it is the same story since decades. And it's not, it's not going to change soon at least. Uh, but don't be afraid of moving emotions and uh, consider that part of good journalism also goes through moving emotions. But of course, uh, a good journalist will try and embed an effective and accurate information within a storytelling. That's why I wanted to also to talk about storytelling in my, in my speech. And Horace, let me jump, uh, jump back on this, the, the relationship with uh, Sam Stork and, and poetry, for instance, where they are able to uh, they move emotions as well, but through um, not necessarily the exact facts, so it doesn't have the, the purpose of conveying the facts necessarily completely, but through like the beauty of the um, explanation of like the scope uh, only. Whereas in the media, in, in newspaper, uh, the core is really uh, like the information being conveyed usually, even though you make a, a story out of the, the participants in, in that research, the, the core is still the content. And I think that ties a bit to the Eric's question and I'll let you read it maybe afterwards because it's a bit long, but um, about the problem of uh, oversimplification. Now, if you want to make something maybe have impact and uh, trigger people's emotion, you necessarily have to kind of simplify some aspects of it and that may be a problem. Um, normally, th that's also a very interesting question and it's something that in, this, uh, in the science communication community we are discussing since decades again about the oversimplification and uh, my first reaction when I hear about oversimplification, which is something that by, by part of scientists, I, see, I hear them quite often blaming the media of oversimplifying their message. Now, uh, my first comment here is normally like, uh, I still, after many years in science communication, I still don't know what is the limit between simplification and oversimplification. Uh, once I will know that, I will probably feel safer in uh, the way I convey my messages. But today, uh, there is no formula that I can uh, apply to make sure that I'm simplifying and not oversimplifying. Uh, uh, so, uh, 
it's hard. I mean, it's tricky. It's and you you should uh, you should consider the side of the, the journalist too. The journalist uh, is quite often has a very short time frame or space where he or she can write and needs to put everything in that. So it's quite obvious that he or she will try and, and simplify the messages. And uh, so it's it's not easy to 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 find the, the border between simplification and oversimplification. And my second comment normally here, it is like, uh, uh, again, we shouldn't be afraid of simplifying and simplifying much. You as a scientist, you build models and you know that models are very, it's, they're a simplification of reality. Uh, so actually my text, I see my text as a model of your science. It's a simplification uh, of, of what you produce. And I try and do my best. And uh, but as as any model, uh, you know, it has a quite of degree of uncertainty, and uh, the data sometimes are rougher than uh, actually the reality it is. So that's part of yeah. uh, of communicating too. That's a very uh, interesting way of seeing it. Uh, and you're writing as a model of our understanding <laughs> of. Uh... It's interesting. Uh, so there's a question by, by Marine who's asking for, um, for uh, advice on how to uh, be more visible and how to contact uh, journalists in media. And how do you know if something is worth contacting the media for? Okay. Uh, how to get in touch with the media. My first um, recommendation here, it is go through your media officers, the communication office in your institution. So uh, today, nearly all institutions, they have a media office or a communication office. Normally they're mm, understaffed, so they're very busy. Uh, but that would be the first step. Uh, reach out the media office and ask them, uh, present your results and ask them how to, to approach the media and they will be able to, uh, to support you. Now, if the media officers are too busy, understaffed, or maybe your institution doesn't have any media office at all, uh, the I, th I, I would I mean the, the second recommendation I would give is like uh, go through a media a journalist that you know or ask your friends if they know a, a, a journalist. Don't. I mean, trying to send emails to uh, to the media and hoping to to get attention, uh, it might it might go, but I would say it's it's it will probably result in a loss of, in a loss of time. If anything, then I would recommend that you try and uh, get in touch with very local media. Um, uh, maybe you, you 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 normally read the national media uh, or even international media, uh, but I would suggest uh, if you have no contacts, if the media office can't help you, then there are the local media, and they're always looking for some uh, info, some some stories from 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 the neighborhood, and they're more easy to reach, and it's a good start actually. So this would be probably my third recommendation to uh, on how to to get in touch with the, with the media. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's some, good. some more question. Yeah. That's good advice. Uh, yeah. Another question is um, how do you know um, that your message is effective? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I I can't answer the question. Uh, <clears throat> the effectiveness of your message actually is something that you probably measure after the message is given. You should run an evaluation. Uh, you know, effectiveness is actually a result of something that you build, produce, and uh, let it work. And then you see actually if it was working. You, you, you build the way it will be effective, but you can measure only after if it was effective. So uh, with the media, because we are now focusing with, uh, with the media, um, I would probably argue that um, I mean, if I was a scientist, my measure of success after uh, after being published in the media would be if I get some feedback from the audience. <laughs> uh, 
uh, if, if I get some emails or some, uh, or maybe some other medias contacting me because, uh, oh, I, read, I, I heard you at the radio, at the local station, and we want to run a story on this other media, on the, on the national media or the national broadcast. This would be probably a kind of uh, a measure of effectiveness, or if a politician or any other stakeholders come back to you. So actually the, me the measure of success would not be in my case being published, rather if I get any feedback from the community or other stakeholders after I've been published. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so there's no uh, extra question. Oh, there's another, sorry, I'm reading the new questions being uh, written. So uh, Eric wrote um, uh, his question on the, the platform again. And let me just read it. Uh, we scientists and journalists working together inherit the society into which we are born, but we are not passive. We also construct the society. And uh, we do so by feeding one or another uh, preference. Societies can change though. They can become more shallow, more impatient, more intolerant, or we can work to increase their dimensionality. My question to you, Jacopo, uh, how much is it appropriate for us to hold values and to take responsibility for creating a society that we believe is healthier and more humanly fulfilling? Yes. That's, that's a great question, you know, it, uh, it would be a great start for a book chapter or, or even for a book. Uh, scientists and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and journalists together uh, in, in building a better and a more sustainable society. I, I'm, I'm, I actually definitely agree with you. And I actually, uh, it's my firm belief that scientists would do good in reaching out to the public and be more um, more uh, uh, active, proactively uh, communicating directly, bypassing as journalists. I shouldn't say that, but it's it's actually my belief. Uh, bypassing us and start being proactively uh, working for a better world, because actually you are the source of the of the only reliable information uh, about us and about how the world is developing, uh, this future scenarios. Uh, so you hold the knowledge, oh, that's, that's, that's true. Uh, and I think you can do a lot. Uh, and sometimes uh, um, uh, with good journalism, you, you probably uh, increase the effectiveness. So going back to effectiveness. Uh, but as a, as a scientist, you can do much on your own. I must tell you that uh, both as a scientist and uh, as, a, as a journalist, I'm increasingly following scientists, no, I, sorry, I said something wrong, both as a communicator and as a journalist, uh, I'm increasingly following um, scientists in Twitter, especially, who are doing a really great job in communicating science, in communicating easily, plain, uh, good quality of information without any filter of uh, any other influencer, journalist, communicator, educator, politician, no one, just the scientist directly to me. Uh, so if you can do that, you are probably uh, bringing a, a valuable, um, uh, something valuable for, for humanity. But there is a filter still though, because you still have to kind of summarize a very complex thought in a tweet or series of tweets, which really is a low bandwidth uh, medium. But uh, thank you for uh, answering this. We have to uh, to finish here. We're a bit late already, but I really do hope that's a very interesting uh, set uh, of, of thoughts. If you have time to uh, answer that into more more depth and have the discussion on the platform, uh, I'd be uh, really looking forward to uh, to that exchange. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm actually going to step in for Toby um, because his internet is a little shaky today and mine is not, which is excellent. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone. Matteo, that was fantastic. And it was gripping uh, listening to all the, all the speakers just then. Um, we're actually going to send everyone to a break now. And we really encourage you to get up and move around and experience your body in space. Um, when we invite you back, it'll be in 15 minutes to the dot. Um, we'll be 
doing two breakouts where you'll get to meet people from all walks of life um, that have joined us on the call today. So we really encourage you to stay. Um, you can leave your Zoom on, just turn your mic off and turn your video off. Um, you'll hear us in the background calling you back in about 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, go and grab a cup of tea, have a walk. Um, we look forward to seeing you in 15. And thanks so much to the speakers. It was really fantastic.